And I hope it's going to be uh, light and fun. <laughs> There's a lot of... Uh, we're going to talk about lo lots of things uh, under the general title of uh, Sino Tibetan and Beyond. Uh, yes. Sino Tibetan and Beyond, there you go. There will be a part one, Sino Tibetan. And uh, there will also be a part two, Beyond, the Great Beyond, which is fine. As I'm concerned, is uh, Austronesian, although conceivably Miao Yao could be somewhere there, lurking in the dark, waiting to be hooked on the onto the, the tree. <coughs> so, uh, topics of interest for Sino-Tibetan reconstruction. I mean, what what the reconstruction of all Chinese can tell us, which is of interest for Sino-Tibetan reconstruction. Well, we've seen this type A, type B question. Is there is there something in Tibeto-Burman that corresponds to the type A, type B distinction? That's one thing. So uh, another thing is uvulars. We have reconstructed uvulars. Is there anything in TB that corresponds to uvulars? Uh, another issue is the issue of iambic presyllables and softened initials. Are there or were there iambic presyllables in Tibeto Burman? If so, do they occasion softening of initials? Is there anything like any softening of initials in uh, Sino Tibetan or in Tibeto Burman? And finally, a bit of morphology. Uh, I think I've, I've just mentioned M, M versus N here, but I'll, I'll review. I will review the morphology, which I, more of the morphology, which, which I think is related, is, uh, is related between Sino-Tibetan and, uh, and between Chinese and Tibeto-Burman. So, and finally, fifth topic, what is the date of Sino-Tibetan? Does the reconstruct of, uh, reconstruction of Chinese have anything to tell us about that? The homeland, where was it, where was Sino-Tibetan spoken? What was the way of life? So we'll, we'll discuss that uh, in the first part. That's five topics. I have how much time for the first part? One hour and 40 minutes. Sorry? One, uh, uh, hour, and 40 one minutes. hour and 40 minutes. That's right. <coughs> 100 so, minutes. So 100 minutes. We'll, be, we'll do 50 minutes on each. So 10 minutes on each topic. Type A, type B. Uh, so until uh, recently, or comparatively recently, Nothing like the AB distinction had been found in Tibeto Burman languages. But as uh, you may know, there is a branch of Tibeto Burman known as Kuki Chin, spoken in part in Burma and in part in eastern India, in states, states like the state of Mizoram, where languages of the Kuki Chin branch are spoken. Uh, the best known of these is called Lushai, and it's the state language of Mizoram. Uh, now, there is a dictionary by Lorraine, which was published in 1940, and which is available on the web. It's, it's, you can find it on the web at this address. Thanks, thank you, Bill, for sending me the, the link. So do check it up. Uh, Lorraine marks vowel length using a circumflex on the vowel. So a vowel with a circumflex on it is long. There are tones in this language, but Lorraine does not mark them. So they're, just, they're simply absent. But more recent uh, uh, studies do mark them and make it plain that there are tones. Now, Sergei Starostin proposed, I'm not sure when or where, but you or can, it's in, book. in its book, that Lushai long vowels correspond to all Chinese type A and short vowels to all Chinese type B. Well, I've been skeptical of this claim for a long time, and recently I have um, uh, collected, used the, the uh, <coughs> Lorraine dictionary and collected as many uh, likely cognates as I could, 
over a hundred of them with Chinese, and I found that indeed uh, what Starostin says is true. Uh, there is a very uh, clear majority of the cognates which conform to Starostin's um, observation. So it's true. It's about at least at least seventy percent, probably a little more than that, uh, which conform to it. Maybe seventy-five percent. I'm not. I'm, I haven't done a very precise. Uh, statistic, uh, but uh, our feeling, Bill and I, is that there is, there is something there and it, there is definitely some kind of correspondence. It's not the 100% uh, correspondence that you might expect, but there can be reasons for that. So any account of the development of type A, type B in Chinese or end in Lushai must take that thing into account. Now the question is, Starostin said that, Starostin thought that uh, that was the nature, that vowel length was the nature of type A type B in Chinese. Because one was wondering, it was clear at some point that type A, the, the, the type A type B distinction was secondary and it must come from somewhere. And where did it come from? Well, Starostin thought it must be vowel length. Look, look at Lushai. But we now have, after Norman's paper, we have very good reasons for thinking that type A type B was not vowel length in Chinese. It was something else. It was probably something like pharyngealization. So now the question becomes, if Lu Shai has vowel length and Chinese has pharyngealization, what, what was there at the top? Okay. So, and this will be my... So, what do you think? <laughs> Any ideas? Is, there, is it plausible that uh, pharyngealization gives vowel length? Suppose pro-Sino-Tibetan had a pharyngeal pharyngealization vote. contrast. Let's vote. Who is in favor? <laughs> <laughs> is it plausible that you get a length contrast out of uh, a pharyngealization contrast? You think it's plausible? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not implausible. I'd vote for pharyngealization in sino -tibetan. Anybody for vowel length? <laughs> Nobody. Good. It's decided. Can I just tell a joke? Tell a joke. <laughs> he wants to tell a joke. Yeah. Jokes first. Yeah, what reminded me of was uh, supposedly there was an American uh, kindergarten class and they had a mouse and they couldn't tell what the sex of the mouse was, and so the teacher asked them to take a vote. <laughs> that's the end, that's all. <laughs> Majority rules. Yes. They should be, they have been quite extensive research in social languages, so we imagine that there are some ideas where they come from and how it affects the development well, until then. Yeah, Starostin and uh, Nikolaev have written an etymological uh, dictionary of the North, North Caucasian languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you probably know, Starostin believed that the uh, closest connection of Sino Tibetan was not to Austronesian but to North Caucasian mm -hmm. and Yeniseyan. Mm -hmm. And for all I know, he might uh, uh, find some connection, but, uh, or might have. Um, and if, I mean, that is a, not an easy read, mm -hmm. okay, but uh, that would be the place to look. Mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly what the answer is. But. Can you take me a look? Okay. Yeah, well, you, you go back. Oh. <coughs> then I just wondering about what Pan was telling us, because it's true that all over time in this house we have sons of the and that Pan's like swallows. Do you see any connection there? Possible with Pan being Pan? Because this is. Uh. As far as I know, no one has ever claimed that there was a uh, correlation between Songqin vowel in some of these tense lax vowels in uh, so southern Chinese languages and type A, type B. Well, uh, but Jin, uh, I think that's what he thought was going on in Middle Chinese. The third division was uh, 
Yeah, but I mean he yeah. hasn't he hasn't found a no, no. hasn't found a correlation between type A type B and the the tense and lax vowels of any southern language. You mean outside of China? Outside of China. Yeah, no. No. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, in the uh, I think maybe Alexis can tell us more about the origins of uh, tense vowels in Tibeto Burman. Burmese. Or whatever it was Burmese? you were going to say. Oh, I, I was <laughs> going to ask a question, not to. Okay, but maybe before your question, you can, you can answer. Uh, actually, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, in Bai, for instance, yeah. uh, there's a vague sense uh, among some linguists that it's something terrible that Chinese did to the language by sort of unsettling its system. But I, I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't know where it comes from. Well, well it's question. Uh, okay, well, there is a... All right, well, I don't have any comment well, on I, I like the theory by Michel Ferlus about the consonant clusters becoming a tense lax opposition on vowels. Mm -hmm. Because that has many analogues in Montmere languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be a possible origin if you had clusters, for instance, uh, sesquisyllabic characters, and then the presyllable having its uh, consonant getting in contact with the initial of the main syllable and then some sort of opposition with the, uh, what would be type B which did not have such consonant clusters and then developing into uh, the vowel changes of Middle Chinese. Okay, well, um. it, it, here's an example. Word for elbow, which is the crew in our reconstruction, okay? Uh, it's something like the crew in, or I forget what it is exactly in Chiarong. It's something like that, the crew. It's a type B word. Mm -hmm. Clearly has a cluster. It's inherited. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Uh, and, and the cluster really, it's an, it's, an in, it's an old inherited cluster. So it doesn't work. So we have the same cluster at the car. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or in TV. Um, I mean, um, in type, uh, because there can be lots of clusters. It doesn't have to be any initial consonant from a pre-syllable that would do this to the consonant cluster. So there can be exceptions. There was also sword. Uh, Guillaume Jacques pointed out sword. It's ruem uh, in Vietnamese. So it underwent uh, sort of. Uh, the um, spirantization of the initial, so there must have been a presyllable yeah. in Vietnamese, yeah. but there's no evidence at all for giving it a presyllable in uh, Old Chinese. But then again, many things can happen in this in such a long lapse of time. So I think it's it's a general hypothesis, and then how it works in every case. Just like the question I was going to to ask is. I mean, this, uh, so where, where does I mean where does uh, Viet, where, where does Vietnam get 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 its syllable? It's a T, by the way. We know from uh, we know from Rook. It's the Kuen in Rook. So where where does where does the T come from? So it, 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 they got it from Chinese. And it's Type B. But but it could there could be some you know mystery. Prefix, um, a mystery prefix. The X prefix. The X prefix, which is unlike the T in some way, yeah. uh, and, and although the T doesn't uh, yeah. cause, uh, doesn't give you type A, maybe mystery prefix does. I mean, and mystery prefix occurs in half, half the vocabulary. That's of course uh, uh, one of the problems. Yes. But just an idea is that in Nasi, for instance, when they borrow a Chinese monosyllabic word. Sometimes they add on another syllable, and sometimes both syllables mean the same thing, or it's a classifier, and so it's possible in the process of borrowing that Vietnamese added a, a pre-syllable. It's possible, but then we would, I mean, we're sure, I mean, but it's not really, it's a little wanton. <laughs> Lots of you can, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can, if you, I don't, it's not the kind of thing that I, I feel comfortable saying that we, this has just been added by, uh, for instance, there's, there's a, 
Well, an, another word. Uh, doesn't doesn't let's doesn't uh, sword have a um, can we look up sword in the uh, yeah in the so uh, hit uh, wait, wait. Uh. Why do we search? Do we know at least uh, what type, what kind of vowel Chris comes in the Do we have long vowels for type A? Yeah, yes. long for, long for type A, short for type B. But we do have weird things in that series. We have words with initial TS in that series, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Which the same phonetic have, as sword. Yeah, the, the head the head word is TSH. So, you know, it, it seems to argue for a some kind of prefix there. Mm. Uh, yeah. And just in case it wasn't prefix, I was thinking in French Guyana, they don't say France, they say en France in an Indian language, uh, which is called Tepo, and that means uh, France, sure, en sure, France, sure. because they borrowed je vais en France, right. uh, son pays c'est en France. Okay. Uh, so what does te mean in, uh, in Vietnam? Yep. What does it, why do they, I mean, if you can find, if you can give me a good reason, I'll buy it, but yeah. what's the reason? Yeah. Okay. Well, it, yeah, that's a general sort of general hypothesis, and in individual cases there would be lots of work, and I'm not in a position to right. give the evidence now. The question I was going to ask is precisely about um, uh, Lush, Lushai, yeah. and you said that it wasn't 100%, and there were reasons why. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's the same kind of uh, evidence you'd want to find for cases. So do you have cases where there is no correspondence, and you have an idea why, in some cases in which there is a correspondence? No, no, no. Uh, I don't have ideas in, in, in particular cases. The, the, uh, what I wanted to say is that the, you, it's possible to think of reasons why a sound correspondence is statistically, signi uh, statistically significant, but and yet not 100%. Or um, you. Uh, well, for one thing, we have uh, words in Chinese with similar meanings, one of which is type A and one of which is type B. So, uh, and the same thing might be true in Lu Shai, for yeah. all I know. So, uh, sometimes the type A word survives and the type B word doesn't. So, what we have left to compare to Lu Shai uh, sometimes might not work because of that. So and I think yeah. certain types of syllables in Lu Shai don't have a a length contrast, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, that's it? right, that's right. And, uh, for instance, the, so some word pairs like ru and uh, na, mm -hmm. and actually under the hypothesis of the consonant clusters and tense lax hypothesis, you would have to reverse mm -hmm. and say that uh, ru is the simpler form, and I think Michel proposed something like nup as a reconstruction for yeah. ru, ru men the ru, yeah. uh, and for na, he said there must be a, so, some sort of prefix, positive yeah. or something else, that, have yeah, a, yeah. that had a, a stop. Yeah. And so C, nope. And that is rather different from what had been reconstructed, but it sort of makes sense that there might have been a prefix in case you derive na from ru, which I'm not sure what you would you think about. I have no a priori. Uh Expectations on whether na should be derived from ru or ru from na, or or, or yeah, I know you do, or uh, you know there are there are other options uh, in in uh, in the Austronesian languages, for instance, you have 
what they call roots. And what's a root? A root is the last syllable of a is the last syllable of a of disyllables. It's it's a, a meaning associated monosyllable meaning associated syllable which occurs exclusively as the second syllable of a monosyllable but you can't identify the first the, the, what the first syllable is it's it's a cranberry type situation you don't know what the, the what the beginning of the word is okay um, now at times these roots can also be reconstructed as monosyllables uh, there's a recent paper on on uh, Mon on uh, Munda in Munchner studies, which makes the which observes that a very similar situation is found in Austroasiatic. That is, you have words, monosyllables, disyllables, and uh, in the second second part of the disyllables, you get recurring forms, meaning associated, recurring syllables that that you don't you don't understand what the first is. So suppose uh, Proto-Sino-Tibetan was like that, you would have had uh, sets of words, you would, have, you would have had roots of this kind, which were sometimes the second, s second syllable of disyllables, and at other times monosyllables. So suppose so these get simplified in in, uh, in the modern languages so that you all, all you get is monosyllables. But suppose that whether it was a disyllable or a monosyllable plays a role, then you're going to have uh, you're going to have doublets of the of, of the kind of na and ru. Okay? And it's not necessarily the, the case that one is derived from the other, at least not very recently. It could be a, a very old type of uh, type of derivation that has been completely obscured. So that's my suggestion. You have to move on. Twenty two minutes already. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uvulars. Are there uvulars in Tibetan Burma? Uh, now those of you who have read Benedict uh, know that he reconstructs velars K and G in proto tibetan burman and that these in general surface as velar stops in the modern languages. But Benedict also observes that in some words, some roots like star, needle, mother, tooth, crab, house, uh, some you, you get velars in most languages, but in zero initial in some languages like Lushai or Burmese, and that's in, uh, in 2526. Note that it's not, it's not all the words. Some of the, some, some of the words, like these, have zero in Lushai and or Burmese. But other words still have velars. Now what does Benedict say about that? He says it's got to do with prefixes. Um, for instance, it's got, it's got to do with uh, when, when a velar stop has a prefix, like in scar, star, and the Kai crab, well, you get a you get zero. I think Benedict had this idea that SK gives zero in general. But I find this weird, but anyway. Bodman thought, Bodman thought that too. Yes. Now problems. Why would that happen? Why would acute prefix consonant cause velars to fall and then fall themselves? Strange. I don't know the answer to that strikes me as bizarre. Moreover, other words reconstructed by Benedict with uh, prefix velars do not lose their velar initial in Lushai and Burmese. For instance, these. Okay? He reconstructs the key to borrow, but Lushai, uh, Burmese has, has a velar. The Ku9, both Lushai and Burmese has, have K. Uh, steel, Lush, Burmese has KH, etc. So, he proposes this explanation, but it doesn't work, given the forms that he reconstructs. Now, there is an alternative solution. Uh, it's to say that, in fact, Benedict's velars have to be, uh, in fact, 
uh, should be uh, split into two, into two sets. One of true velars, which appear as, as velar everywhere, and a set of uvulars, which appear as velar in most languages, but as zero in Lucia and Burmese. Okay, so that would explain why these words, star, needle, molar, tooth, crab, house, etc., have, have zero in Lucia and Burmese. That's because they would be proto sino tibetan velars. And that, in fact, is what Peros and Starostin proposed in the uh, Comparative Dictionary of 96. Uh, so you would say that Lushai R comes from Kar, Lushai I from Kai, Lushai In from Kim. Okay. You didn't know that? Uh, And in Burmese, am, molar tooth from kam, ap, needle from kap, im, house from kim. Uh, now compare, I forget what it is, but compare, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I just said that. Oh, yes. Yeah, compare these three guys with Chinese, han, jo for molar tooth, because molar tooths are on the jaw. <coughs> this double G here is in fact our way of saying that we are not sure whether it's a velar or a uvular. It could be a uvular. Okay, so I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that Burmese am is in, is in fact to be compared with old Chinese han. Okay, the correspondence of final m's is good. Schwa with a is good. And the initial could be a, a, a uvular, so it's not it's not so bad. Actually, the phonetic series would suggest a uvular because yes. it's yin yang. Yes, absolutely. It's in, we. Uh, I, I did it. it yeah. Is a reconstruction by Beros and Starosin. Han Han Kim. No, uh, I think I. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but who who reconstructed? It? Just tentative preliminary, just to, for discussion, not to be cited. Uh, needle, we reconstruct the gum. Okay, so here you get the you get the Q. I mean, you get the Q. The schwa again is good, and the M to P in needle correspondence between M and P has, uh, well, is not what you would like ideally, but then interchange between nasals and stops at the same point of articulation is very common in, in Sino-Tibetan, so that's not too bad. And moreover, you know, the, 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 uh, the other way of writing gen, the modern way of writing gen with a, with a, with a sh, with a ten, well, that points to a t, to a p. It, it, it means that there must have been a variant of gen, which ended in P. So that would be the cup corresponding. It's not just the, the modern character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, the, the, in fact, the uh, sugar yeah, yeah, could yeah. very well be originally representing yeah. a needle. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well, uh, uh, and, you know, this character, it's not, it's not, very, it's not a very common character. It's yin. Yin. Di shi ye. Uh, in Shuowen, I think. Di uh, a, a room, a subterranean room, or a, a living, a place for, well, some kind of living place, which is underground. And uh, one possibility, you know that uh, the, in, the, in the old type, the, uh, the Neolithic houses in, in northern China were semi-subterranean. So it would make sense that, I mean, this, if, supposing that this was the old name of the house, of the semi subterranean house in northern China, it would make sense that that word would have been taken to uh, Tibeto Burman regions. Okay? Now, what do you think? Well. 
Yes, Sven. Do the zero initial reflexes in both languages match? Or do we get separate words? So do you have one? In Lushai and Burmese? For how, how do they seem to have <coughs> there, oh. there is a, at least there is some overlap. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how, just how much, uh, how much overlap there is. But you could imagine that, as in Chinese, uh, you get you get you, you, you get both ve uvulars have both velar and zero reflexes. So that would you know you have um, a prefixation influences the reflex so that in some case in in one language you get a velar and the other in, in the other other language you get a zero. But I think basically there is some overlap. It's you know Benedict cited these roots. He thought that there were there was some overlap. Yep. Something out. Uh, this if this if we're right in our database in having this this means this is a division for Trunio, which means that this I is very secure, and so that that at least is one. And of course the M matches the M. Okay, uh, but this is also a good example of a faux de mieux phonetic because most of the words written with this phonetic have a schwa vowel. So ordinarily you don't use a, a phonetic with a different vowel, but again you've got a, a rather uncommon type of syllable, and as far as I know, I don't know what you would use if you wanted to use a phonetic that had, was Q-I-M. I don't know what that would be. So that's two things. I'll be with that. Yeah, Tibet, Tibetan definitely has dealers there. Yeah. Yeah. Burmese, it's definitely no, no um, initial, or is it a global stop, which is not indicated, or? Um Burmese always has a global stop, yeah. yeah. But, okay, you know, so you don't <laughs> have zero, you don't, uh, you don't have vowel initial, yeah. it doesn't contrast with anything. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say that um, you know, we now have a project plan. There is one group in China who is uvulous in all languages with accent languages and any problems with the group. And that's one of the things that we're definitely going to look at, looking at the history of the group, what is going on and where the uvulus come from, and then it could be for us an extremely precious thing to compare with all Chinese and Pacific kind of evidences for possible complex loans and genetic relationships. And I prepared my list of Shisinos oh, right. with Ukula, so then we can look at them together. Yeah. I don't know on the top of my head, I'm suspecting that maybe Nido would have Ukula, but uh, how subterranean, they don't have subterranean houses. No, it's, so it doesn't so mean really subterranean, it means, it means house in, in Tibetan Burman, not subterranean. That's in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would look at it the well, in Well, in Tiarong, these three words have uvulars. Okay, so it's not zero. So they have uvulars, not vilars, not zero. They have uvulars yeah. in Tiarong, yeah. in Japu. Well, I suspect that Tiarong has also an uvular, but there's some All right, we move on. Okay, so I am the three syllables and softened initials. So Benedict reconstructed Tibetan Burman P and B, uh, but he observed that these two stops, these two bilabial stops, change to W, and predictably in Tibetan Burman languages like uh, Qingpo, Burmese, Garo, and Lushai. For instance, a word which he reconstructed as Pak, meaning uh, Tibetan Burman Pak, Ping. Well, this word goes to Pag in Tibetan, regular, nuclear Pak. But in Qingpo it's Kawa, Burmese it's Wa, Garo Wa, Lushai Rua. Okay, so he says, well, you know, uh, so, well, he says maybe those, uh, this was not the, the, the usual kind of P, maybe this was a PW, and uh, PW changes to were in some languages, and it stays as P in others, 
Uh, Marisov recently has a, a slightly different uh, explanation, but uh, I wonder if uh, you know. Look at Jingpo; it has a k prefix, an iambic prefix. It could be. I suspect it could be that that thing here that uh, caused the lenition of the p to a w. Okay, uh, and then the pre the Iambic prefix would have been lost in other languages. So, what do you think? Just a I just a thought. Well, look at the word for cotton. There's a, uh, it's Burmese wa, I forget what tone, but it's apparently from the aerial word kapas, uh, cotton, which sometimes kapas, which is apparently Austroasiatic but borrowed into a lot of languages of the region, including Austronesian. Uh, so here, why would you get a W in Burmese if it's not morphology, it's not PW, it's just a P that's between two, two vowels. So. Just a thought. Any comments on that? And what would cause a B when it is worse? Sorry? What would cause a change to a B when it is worse? What would be the difference between worseless and worse? It doesn't seem to make a difference. Apparently not. It's P and D go to W. In some words, but not in others. All right? Let's move on. Sino Tibetan morphology. S applicative, very common in TB. So I'm just going to give you, uh, I told you about old Chinese morphology. This is just to show you that the morphology is the same morphology. The same affixes basically are found in Tibetan Burma. So for instance, uh, Tibetan has mbar to burn, catch fire, be ignited, intransitive. Sbarpa to light, to kindle, ki kindle? Kindle. kindle to inflame. Tiarong to see, to show. Borogi, be afraid of. Sigi, frighten. Protololoish, consonant, no, to awake. Suno, to awaken, transitive. Right? So, that's this S prefix in Chinese is inherited. Right? Uh, intransitive, capital N, in Tibetan Burman languages, here. I think the example that I uh, like best is the Tiarong, where you get pairs like this, Kachop, to set fire. So Ka is a, ka is a verbal prefix, don't, just, you, don't, you don't look at it. You pretend it's not there. And intransitive is Kunjop, where you get a, a nasal place before the, the root, the nasal voices the root, and the meaning gets intransitive. Kapak to split open, come back to be rent. Kachop to break, kunjop broken. Kaklak to wipe off, kunglak to fall. And that's obviously our law shalai, the law shalai, the law. Uh, so that's pretty clear, isn't it? Well, in Tibetan, there are there is an alternation of voicing. You get mm -hmm. voiceless intransitives, and voice sorry voiceless transitives mm -hmm. and voiceless intransitives. So it's like Middle Chinese, really. Yeah. They have mm -hmm. they they come from there, but they have evolved to the voice voiceless mm -hmm. stage, and it's like in Middle Chinese. Mm -hmm. So at first, people thought you see when they were comparing t Tibetan and, and Middle Chinese, 
looking at Middle Chinese, looking at Tibetan, they thought that this, this kind of alternation yes, know, must yeah, have yeah, been in, in Proto-Sino-Tibetan. Yeah. That's wrong. Yeah. What there was in Proto-Sino-Tibetan is a nasal yeah. prefix. Okay. All right, let's move on. So volitional causative M in Tibetan languages, this, la this prefix has not been recognized. Uh, but there's good grounds for recognizing it. For instance, uh, in the Qin languages, uh, that's that's the cookie. That's uh, in Qin. Sorry, that's one of the cookie the uh, one of the cookie Qin languages that was mentioned in a moment ago. You get pairs like do be good versus mdo make well heal. Hot to leave, mshot to drive out. Don to run, madon cause to run away. Q this I don't know how to pronounce this. Q disappear, mq bury cause to disappear. All right, and in the same language, as in Chinese, you get uh, you get d m denominal verbs. That is, m will you 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 use m to derive verbs out of nouns. You, you remember this was this was in Chinese too. The so, way, right? it's not the other way. Uh, the, the you just said verbs are nouns. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no. I think it's it's I think it's no. It's verbs out of noun. Sorry, this is wrong. It's it's oh. really verbs out of noun. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. So I have to correct this. So, ku smoke, maku to make smoke. Uh, tui uh, medicine to cure. And there's a few examples of that kind. Okay, so it's not in, it's not in common. Like as just like in Chinese. Now the R infix is not uh, recognized by specialists of the Tibeto-Burman languages, but and in fact it's been a, it's been a, it's an ongoing fight to get that infix recognized. But there are good examples, I think, of the R infix in Tibeto-Burman. For instance, in Burmese, pok a drop of liquid versus proc, speckled, spotted. That is, you, get, you need a lot of drops to be speckled or spotted. Pu, to, pr to protuberate, versus pru, to protuberate, as the eyes. And one of the tones is secondary, I forget which. Uh, so of course it's to protuberate in two places. Kachin, pun of pimples to appear on the body. Prun, pimples, to appear <laughs> of the body of pimples. So this this G is, an, is from an R. No, not good? Well, the meanings, though, are just about the same, right? I mean, there's no semantics. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are as many pimples in the first case. Yeah, it's, as it's, yeah that's <laughs> right. I mean, there's no detectable contribution of the prefix, but it's, uh, it's definitely a... It, it is plural. It or is definitely a. Case. Yeah. You don't just have. You okay. just have one <laughs> Well, sometimes. Okay, S suffix. So I've mentioned the. Um, what's it called? The uh, perfective function of the S suffix. That's that's in that's in Tibetan. So it's very well known. Actually, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Forrest was the first to point out the correspondence between Chu Sheng and China that he found he finds he found some perfective uh, functions of Chu Sheng in Chinese and said that this had to do with the, the S suffix of Tibetan. S but another function of the S suffix in Tibetan Burman is to derive nouns. You find that in Tibetan. Many examples Skiab to protect this is Kyab's protection. Groba to walk, gross the act of walking. Briba to draw right. Ris figure form design. This oh, B M, yeah. this B is intrusive here. Uh, so it's really a re re root. Okay. Any comments on this uh, sharing of morphology? Well, just coming back to my question yesterday, so it's 
I'm doubtful that what you have no Chinese is matching what you can find in better German languages. Yeah. But can you count the things which are found in better German languages and should, in principle, be present also in Chinese? Some old things as Gardner Human, Phenomenal Human, some things which are now reconstructed way down, for instance, with those things. Would you? Well, I mean, there's, 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 two, there's several, several layers to, the, to your question. Uh, the first thing is that, in principle, s suppose that the idea that uh, Sino-Tibetan is really Chinese versus the rest is true, then if that idea is true, you cannot say that something which is in, si in, Tibet Bur in proto tibeto burma must be in Chinese or, or, or the reverse. Okay, So something which is, even, even if verb agreement was reconstructable to PTB, you wouldn't have to find you wouldn't have to find it in Chinese. It could be an innovation of PTB after the split mm. uh, with Chinese, or it could be that Chinese lost it mm. on the way. I mean, e e either of those. Now I thought the question was mostly not that there is a split because it's not supported by anything, but it's rather uncertain where it should be put into the family Chinese. So it's not really well, so clear cut. That it's, it's not supported by anything. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, there uh, one, one small thing which mm -hmm. might be relevant is that, uh, and uh, Starson also pointed this out, uh, you have two vowels in Chinese corresponding to one in, in Tibeto-Burman mm -hmm. in the both A and Schwa correspond to Tibeto-Burman mm -hmm. A. Mm -hmm. But uh, then he found, I think, in some no. Tibeto-Burman I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a pretty weak uh, uh, basis for, for defining a whole branch. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I, 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 the difficulty here uh, is that you need. Uh, there are a lot of words that are in just in Chinese, or, or in a lot of words that are just in Tibeto Burman and not in Chinese. So some of these words have to be innovations, but it's, possi uh, it's possible. It's uh, possible. Some of these words have to be retentions from Proto Sino Tibetan, which have been lost in Chinese. But it's very li it's possible that some of them are innovations, are uh, Tibeto Burman innovations. Mm -hmm. The difficulty in distinguishing the retentions from the innovations is that you would need a an external language mm -hmm. to uh, to judge that. And I think I'm beginning to find some examples which I think are, are Tibeto Burman innovations. I can't discuss them right now, but I think that. They exist. Uh, at any rate, I think you can explain why it's difficult to do. It's difficult to do if you don't have an external mm -hmm. language. But if you suppose Tibeto Burman, Tibeto Burman has a, a word which is in common with Chinese. Sorry, excuse me. Suppose I'm right that Austronesian is related to Sino Tibetan mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And then suppose that you find words that are in Austronesian and, and in Chinese. If these words do not appear in, Sino in Tibeto Burman, that means they must have been lost mm -hmm. and replaced by another word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I know some of these examples. Uh, I'm not ready to discuss them now, but uh, at any rate, what I'm saying here should throw some light on why it's difficult to do if you do not have an external. Okay. Uh, right. As to the reconstruction of uh, of uh, verb agreement, verbal agreement in in Tibetan Burman, I'm not I'm not convinced at all. Phenomenal agreement. Uh, we have no. Well, if that was right, then that would be uh, that would be a good candidate for it would be a good candidate for Sino Tibetan. Although no, not all not all Sino Tibetan languages have it. Anyway, let's move on. So Sino Tibetan date, homeland, and way of life. So what was the Proto Sino Tibetan way of life? These guys were farmers, and they didn't have any metal. There are no shared metal names between Chinese 
in Tibet or Burma, or rather the ones that there are are clearly not uh, not original. The word there's the word for silver, which is yin in Chinese and dmul in Tibetan, but First of all, the word appears very late in Chinese. It also appears very late in Chinese uh, archaeology. Uh, so it cannot, it just cannot be Proto-Sino-Tibetan. Uh, and there are alternative forms in, in Tibeto-Burman, like Gmul, which suggests that even Gmul is not original. Okay, so that's, silver is out. Uh, Yep. What does he mean, proto vocabulary? Includes included what? He hasn't told us yet. Attends, il faut que je clique sur la que je clique sur la prochaine. Je deviens je suis impatient. Je suis bavard. Retiens ton impatience. J'ai soif. C'était c'est pour ça d'ailleurs en fait. En fait j'ai c'est pour faire monter la faire monter la pression. C'est un instant. Oui alors il y a le mot le mot pour faire le chax. Um, on Tibet. Um, oh, yes, there's the word for iron, the chucks in Tibetan, and with, that seems to be a loan from Chinese tier. Okay, so no, no, no reconstructable metal words. Anyway, uh, iron uh, metallurgy begins in 700 uh, BC, no earlier. That's the absolute uh, earliest in East Asia. So certainly not Proto-Sino-Tibetan. So these guys were farmers. Their proto vocabulary includes. Name for foxtail millet. You know foxtail millet? I'll show you a picture. The word is tsuk, Cetaria italica. And that word is found in Tibetan Burman in trong as tja, meaning millet. And in hlokpu as tsuk, exactly the same. So that's one case, that's one case where, where you get a schwa in TB corresponding to, yes. to, an, to a schwa in Chinese. It didn't go to a. And the plant was identified by George Van Dream in Flokpu, and that's in Nepal. It's in Nepal, yeah. So, foxtail millet. They knew foxtail millet. Probably grew foxtail millet. What else did they have? They had rice. How do we know? There's several words. There's the word for husk grain, and that's li in Chinese. Mrats, and that corresponds to Tibetan mras, rice. In Tibetan is mbras. There's a word for polished grain ready to cook, and that's to me. That's the word mi, the well-known word mi. So rice and millet, and they had animals. Of course, they had dogs, uh, they had pigs. Uh, I think the word is shi, and that corresponds to hlik in the um, Tani languages. Okay. Sheep, as we saw yesterday, that's yang. And they had no horses. The Chinese word ma is alone, is apparently alone from a Tibetan Burman language where it was pronounced as mrang. And um, so I'm ready to argue that. The correspondence is not regular. There should be there should be an eng in Chinese at the end if it was regular for it to be regular. It's irregular because it's alone. And I think they lost the eng was lost. I mean one good reason for the for the eng to be lost is if the donor language had nasalized the, the, the vowel, that is, it would be mran in, in, in the donor language. Okay, any comments on this? Questions, comments? Yes. Um, is there Chinese internal evidence for this in the, in the Marat? Yes. Oh, so yes, this yeah. is uh, one. One, yeah. It's the phonetic in one, 10,000. Which begins with an M. Yeah. And there's also uh, there's also there are other words in, uh, beginning in M in this in this series. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the uh, the explanation for why we have an initial L in Middle Chinese is that uh, it, it was an iambic prefix which fell. Yeah. And this incidentally is a word that has type A, type B, several several uh, one type A, one type B variant. Uh, all right, let's move on. Cetaria italica. Have you ever seen Cetaria italica? That's what it looks like. It looks like a foxtail. That's why it's a foxtail millet. Uh, so these little things, these things here, are not are not grains. They're they're packets of grain. Tiny, tiny, tiny grains. Cetaria italica. G. Now, where did the Sino-Tibetans live? Well, Cetaria italica helps us figure it out. Uh, they live where Cetaria italica was cultivated. And where was... Why does it do that? Why does it do that? Subversion. It's no good. Well, Cetaria italica 5,000 years ago, oh sorry, 5,000 years BP, uh, yeah, 5,000 years ago, was cultivated in this, in this, in three regions in East Asia. In fact, the main region was in the Huanghe Valley here, and also in the Wei River Valley. There's a lot of archaeological sites there. And just a little before 5000 BP, 5300, Cetaria italica occurs at Karuo, near Lhasa in Tibet. And at 5000 BP, Cetaria italica is found near Hainan here. Okay. Uh, and six, just a little before that, at six, maybe 6000 BP, Cetaria italica is not found at all here, not found there, but it's found in a, in a more restricted region here. Okay, so uh, there is a kind of general agreement uh, kind of general agreement but on, on fuzzy agreement that the date of Sino-Tibetan is at 6000 BP and that's completely impressionistic there's no no clear reason why it should be so but uh, a lot of authors agrees, uh, agree that it's around that date so it's not implausible. Bill once told me that he thought it was a little more recent than that, maybe 5,000. Who knows? No idea. <laughs> I think I once wrote that it was 7,000. <laughs> Completely. But maybe in that region. And so if these people, if the proto sino tibetans were farmers 6,000 years ago, if there were farmers 5,000 years ago, they could have been in, in any of these places, and probably in between two. If it was 6,000 years ago, it was probably there. And that's my bet, there. Any comments? Criticism, questions? Uh, in Xi'an, any research uh, that you have done? Well, Panpo Shizu. Panpo is, is, is near Xi'an. It's here. Yeah. And it's about 5,000... Uh, is it 5... No, it's, it's 7,000 BP. No, BP, no? So. 5,000 BP? I don't know. I, think it, I thought it was about 3,000 BC. 3,000 BC? I think it's, old, I think it's older than that. So 5, 5 BC, I would say. No? Well, I think it's 5 BC. Well, we 5, don't know. Well, I, don't, I haven't any research on those people uh, specifically, but I think I mean they were a part of that of that complex, which was probably related to Sino to Sino Tibetan in some way. Any Alexis? No. All right. 
So, let's move on. Beyond Sino-Tibetan. Uh, and let's start with something Sino-Tibetan to go beyond. Shangsheng, in Chinese, as global stop, as you remember from our reconstruction. Uh, now, what does this global stop correspond to in Tibet of Burma? As far as we can tell, there are two correspondences. One of which is to Tibetan, Tibetan Burman K, as you see here, which is G in Tibetan, that's regularly G, but K elsewhere. Here are some examples. I, I'm sure I could have found uh, many more examples. Probably the word for pink, which I just mentioned, is one. Shi, to flick. Uh, and the other correspondence is to zero. As you have in words like like these. Okay? Uh, right. Now, oh no! Why do we do that? The font problem, No. No, no, no. Can I? Oh no. No. Squirrely font. Um if you wanna temporize I can see if I can fix it. Uh yeah, maybe I should shift to the other computer. Change to the other I'll change Let's let's break five minutes and I'll, I'll, I'll just change to another computer. This uh, this table shows in the first column pro Austronesian words, in, in the second column all Chinese words, and in the third column column uh, Tibeto Burman words. First one is vomit or spit. Pro Austronesian utak. All Chinese ta. Lushai Chak. Um, notice the circumflex here that tells you that it's a long vowel. And this is an example that fits the, 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 the rule. Now, CHH in Lushai comes from TH. So this was at some point a long Tak, Tak with a K in Lushai, right? So here we have K to global stop. So that's the first correspondence. The last line is uh, pro austronesian punuk with a Q, or Chinese nuk with a global stop, pro tibeto burman nuk with a K. Right, so that's again the first correspondence. Global stop to K. And in both cases, you have Q in Austronesian. In the middle cases, in the, in, in, in the Earth example, you have pro austronesian tak, T-A-Q, or Chinese ta. Global stop to Q. And to shoot is Panak, all Chinese Na crossbow. The, here the correspondent, the, the semantics require a little ex explanation, and I don't have time to do that. But what I'm driving at here is that there is a correspondence between Pro Austronesian Q, all Chinese global stop, and Tibeto Burman K. Right? And in general, the part of the Austronesian, you know, the, the green, the, the gray cells, the, the gray areas, show, show you what corresponds to what. So in general, it's the last syllable of Austronesian words that correspond to Old Chinese and tibeto burman Unless the medial is a liquid, in which case you have a cluster. A cluster is formed between the first two consonants, at least in some cases. Mm. Any questions on these? No? It's this really doing on what's so funny. What's so funny? <laughs> what's so funny? Out with it. Okay. No, it's probably the way we look at it. Okay. Mm. 
think it's that I'm eating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's got to be here. Oui, oui, il y avait un mot, il y avait un oui, ça c'était la deuxième correspondance. Je reviens, je reviens. Pour le bénéfice de Michel. Là. Pour... Alors, maintenant Michel. À ton avis, est-ce que je vais dire qu'il y a un... Est-ce que je vais trouver un mot austronésien qui, a un... qui finit par Q ici Je ne connais pas l'austronésien, mais il y a un mot austronésien qui finit par le euh, Q. Alors voilà. Le mot austronésien finit par H. Et dans le cas de tête, le mot austronésien finit par H. Alors, ici justement, c'est un cas où le. Pardon Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know if anybody left to read English, or maybe you should switch to Yes, the Austronesian words here end in H. The Chinese words end in global stop, and the tibeto burman words end in zero. So that's another correspondence, I think. In other words, what we see here is a situation where Chinese has merged two Sino-Tibetan endings, which are preserved in tibeto burman And Austronesian shows the same distinction. Now, just from Sino-Tibetan, Suppose uh, you have that situation, you have, in Chinese, you have a global stop. In, Aust in, Austrian, in uh, tibeto burman you have zero. That's one correspondence. And in Chinese, you have a global stop. tibeto burman you have K. What do you reconstruct? Well... Uh, in my opinion, it's pretty clear that you have to reconstruct. I mean, one of the obvious things that you you have these two correspondences. What are you going to reconstruct here? What are you going to reconstruct here for Sino-Tibetan? Well, a Q here makes good sense. It's going to change to K here to global stop here, and here any kind of laryngeal other than Q, either a global stop or an H makes pretty good sense. It's going to change. To, it's going to drop here and to be retained in Old Chinese. And that's what you find in Austronesian. You find in Austronesian the preceding stage. Q here, H here. All right? Comments? No, Hein? En proto-sino-tibétain proto austronésien, proto-stan, l'austric, euh, nous n'acceptons ne... enfin, pas, pas, nous ne faisons pas cet article. Ok, un autre exemple. Um, these examples show you what happens when you get a, when you get some kind of liquid in the medial consonant position. Okay, you have to think that these words are Proto-Sino-Tibetan Austronesian, and they have a medial. They have a, a, a liquid, an R, a capital R, or some, some some kind of R, in the medial position, in the medial consonant. Okay. In such cases, it's not the final syllable of Austronesian that is found in Sino-Tibetan. You get a cluster that consists of the first consonant here and the final syllable here. This is a prefix, okay? It's a body part prefix. So, look at these forms. 
קורונג, קרוק, and garo, תדבר בבן לנגוויץ', גרונג, and compare for rib, תקרונג, all Chinese crack, that's the word for bone, in the li ti, and it's, it means the bones of sacrificed animals, so it's an old, old word for, for bone, and garo is greng, and it means bone. Mm. The word means rib in Austronesian. It means bone in Old Chinese. In Garo it means bone, so it's not the same meaning, but it's common for words for bone to come from the name of a special kind, a particular kind of bone. For instance, the, I think the uh, Serbo-Croatian word for bone is kosti, and that comes from rib, as you see in Latin costa. Okay. Now there is evidence in, in Tibeto-Burman that this word originally means a rib because in, in the language of Sichuan, I forget which, uh, the word for rib is rao kzhang and rao is the other word for bones, that's grus and kzhang is the, the word that carries, kzhang is this one and it's the word that carries the meaning rib. So it's clear that this Tibeto-Burman, this Sino-Tibetan word for bone is in fact, is also a, a word for rib. It's probably an old word for rib. So, some correspondences. You get QR, KKR, GR, QR, KKR, GR. Looks pretty good. Does anybody here want to say that these are not sound correspondence? All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not only do you have some correspondences, you have shared morphology. Applicative prefix, the S prefix, you find in Austronesian. Okay, for an, just an example from Atayal. Mungungu, to be afraid. Sungungu, to frighten. Mm. Intransitive prefix, nasal intransitive prefix. Proto-Austronesian, patsai to kill, matsai to die, be dead. Uh, this one is shared by tibeto burman and Austronesian, but not by Chinese. It's, uh, or there may be some examples in Chinese, but they're completely lexicalized. Uh, the, the, the N suffix is still... Um, clearly seen in uh, Tibetan, in Tibetan, you get many derivations of nouns out of verbs by adding an N prefix, for instance, to eat and food, za zan, okay, many, many examples like this. Austronesian also, can, can, n food. R infix, katap, in Malay, katap, karatap, to bite teeth repeatedly. Conclusion, shared basic vocabulary with sound correspondences, shared morphology, equals genetic relationship, not chance, not contact. What do you think? Is it true? <laughs> yes. Just in reference to one example before, you know, like, um, Hapsai, to kill. Sorry? Hapsai, to yeah. kill, Masai, uh, yeah. to be dead. Yeah. And how, how is, uh, yeah, possible. Yeah. So, Tsai alone is attested as to die? Yeah, Tsai has to be die, yes. 
but it doesn't you don't have it uh, yeah alone it, it's it means to die uh, well, you don't have it alone. I mean, the root, the root alone probably means die. I agree with you that the root must mean die. But in Austronesian, you don't have tsai all by itself. When you say to die, it's always matsai, and dead is always matsai. Mm -hmm. So, in the normal, you don't have pairs of positive and non-positive words, which are like pa plus x for the positive, and nothing. Yeah, plus but. X for Pa is pa is uh, you do have uh, pa is a productive prefix. Ma is a productive prefix, and usually you uh, I forget what I was going to, what I was going to say. What what what's the problem? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah. Top, yeah. Uh, without ma in the corresponding uh, interest. Yes, yes. You, you 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 take a verb and you put pa in front of it and you get a and you get a causative of that verb. Uh, but that's that's the case here. I mean, the the problem is that this this form is reconstruct these two forms are reconstructable to proto austronesian they were already in proto austronesian mm -hmm. most of the pairs that you see now are not proto austronesian pairs they they're recent pairs uh, and you have the root you put pa pre preceding the root you get a causative you get you put ma before the root you get you get an intransitive but the thing is most monosyllables have disappeared from Austronesian. Austronesian doesn't like monosyllables, it, it makes disyllables out of them. But it reduced, uh, as, as we've seen in the correspondence before, to get monosyllables. Oh no, no, so true. It just makes that sense. Um, sorry. Hmm. Yes, Captain. I think somebody asked me about this one one Thank you, Katia. That will be our next slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have a simple question. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, a dialect in Huanghe Liu Yu Jianghua that mm -hmm. uh, is actually uh, uh, at the present, it's Jiangsu Xuzhou, and they say eat, they say K. That's from yeah. Hmm? Yeah. It's the it's written as uh, like chu. I mean, there is a character that uh, there is a reading of chu, which is qi and with kick. Okay. Actually, it's the chu that's difficult to explain, mm -hmm. not the k. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, the words in Cantonese also heck. Yeah. If you look at the phonetic, I mean, there are two ways to write chi, right? There's one with qi and uh, the other one with uh, qi, that's something more complicated, right? Ah, um, And uh, uh, both of those imply a kh, right? So what's bizarre and what I don't understand is why Mandarin has chi uh, there instead of qi. And some Mandarin, some varieties of Mandarin do have qi, as you said. Well, I had prepared a nice animation, and you were going to see these uh, things appear one after the other. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It's because it's a PDF. <laughs> uh, so what? What? Just imagine. <laughs> uh, First, you see that thing. It's the date is five thousand BP, and you see that thing. That's where you get millet before five thousand BP, maybe six thousand, seven thousand, and the earliest millet that you get is eight thousand BP or a little even eight 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 oh five, in places like uh, Jiahu here. Uh, the people who had millet probably had rice too. They came. 
They're actually, it's a, actually an expansion. Rice gets domesticated in this zone, in the Tianghe, uh, in the Yangtze re region, about 10,000 BP. And probably gets domesticated at a moment when the weather cools. These are people who, who, are, who collect wild rice in the lakes and uh, on the river sides in this region. It's very, very wet. So there's a lot of wild rice on the river sides and the lakes and they collect it and they eat it and it helps them get uh, push up their population. Their population densities increase because there's a lot of it. And suddenly, bam, weather suddenly gets cold. That's, it's a, uh, an episode that's called the Younger Dryas. And in the Younger Dryas period, that's about 11,000 BP, suddenly whew, temperature uh, falls very suddenly. And incidentally, it also falls suddenly in the Near East, which is when wheat gets domesticated in the Near East. So what do these people do? The uh, <coughs> temperatures drop, the northern limit of rice moves south, and these people find themselves high and dry. And the only thing they can do to, to maintain their population densities, which means not to die of <laughs> famine, is <laughs> just to plant, to help rice grow. Not If you let it grow all by itself, it's not going to work out, so you need to weed, you need to, you need to select the best seeds, you need to plant. You need to replant the rice, to, to select seeds to replant, because otherwise it's not going to work. And you need to help, uh, you need to, to help it grow, basically. So that's domestication. So rice gets domesticated in this region about 10,000 BP. And the fact of knowing how to grow rice allows them to move to move north. And by the way, about 10,000 BP, the weather grows warm again. So they, now they, it's, it's a bit easier. And they move north. But in moving north, they find themselves in a zone which is drier and in which they need a second cereal to help them in the dry years. And that's when they domesticate Cetaria Italica, 8,000 BC here. So Cetaria Italica is domesticated by people who already have rice. Okay, so the domestication of Cetaria Italica occasions a second expansion, and that's what you see here. Expansion between 5,000, between uh, 8,000 BP, 6,000, and, and, and 5,000 BP, something like that. You see that expansion. And uh, the next thing you see is this dotted line this green dotted line here. That means there is, I suppose, there is a break between an, an Eastern dialect here and a Western dialect here. Why do you get this break? This is because this region is a very, is, is a marsh. It's a, it's a wetland. Zhang Guangzhi, the China archaeologist, calls this region the wetland. Okay, so you can cross it, but communications between East and West are not, uh, are not easy. So it's this kind of situation in which dialects are going to evolve. At 5000 BC, or between 6 and 5000 BC, you see people moving here and bringing rice and millet here, 5000, and millet in Karo. So the next thing you see is this ellipse uh, which is for Sino-Tibetan and that ellipse which is for Austronesian. The languages here have all died. They've been killed by Chinese. Okay, All the languages that were once in this region have been killed by Chinese. Except maybe Miao Yao if it was in this region. We don't know where Miao Yao was. Uh, so that's that's to answer your question. Any comments? Maybe it's uh, obvious, but if you look at an elevation map of China, uh, you'll see that 
the mountains come over to about here and then they drop off. So in, in Shanxi you've got the uh, mountains and you've got an island out here, basically what used to be, Shandong used to be an island. Uh, and all of this stuff is mud from the Yellow River, which has filled that in. And that's the area, I guess, that uh, Lohan was talking about. But it's very, very clear if you look on a, uh, on a uh, uh, elevation map of China. And of course, uh, another thing that has happened to reduce the linguistic diversity, I imagine, is the Yellow River in recent millennia, at least, uh, floods every so often. And uh, at least uh, in recent times, it kills tens of thousands of people when it floods. And then some more people come in to take the place of after the after the floods are gone. So the population in this area, I think, uh, even I mean I'm talking about even a much later date, uh, even the diversity of Chinese dialects is reduced here because of the influx of people speaking uh, the dialects from other places. So, so and, but I think where you still have uh, more diversity in the, in Chinese dialects is in this uh, mountainous region here and along this uh, coastal area and things like that. Um, there's also hills in the south of uh, Hunan, right? And along the border between Hunan and Guangdong, and that's uh, sort of another area which is probably a lot of archaic stuff. But it's very interesting to look at the, the map and some, of course, some of the places if you look at this historical map, some of the places in this uh, Jianghuai area, uh, like Yencheng, places like that, uh, they're inland now, but uh, look at the map of the Shang Dynasty or something, they were right on the coast. Right? So there's, a, been, there's land there that didn't used to be there before. I mean, just to comment about that. Now, if you want to be, if you're looking for evidence that these people, Austronesian and Sino-Tibetans, went through Neolithic together, here's um, a table. Uh, here again, you're supposed to see first this green ellipse. Incidentally, I, so this shows the word for, the green ellipse shows the word for cook, cooked rice in Austronesian, that's semai. <coughs> And for what I what I say here is rice plant and husk grain, but I think actually it's it's grain that's ready to cook. I've changed. Yeah, I think it's wrong. So uh, mai and semai, something like that. And remember, there is an an, um, an iambic prefix in Chinese. So that's the name of the rice plant. Husk rice that we've seen is mras, something like mras in Sino-Tibetan. It's Beras in Austronesian. And here again you see the cluster forming because there's an, an R in the middle. Uh, and finally the word of Setaria is Tsuk here and Batseng here. Now the Eng and K do not correspond, but in fact it's just as in it's just as in uh, It's just as here, okay? Except that here you get eng, sorry, you get eng in garo instead of k in garo, uh, instead of k. But eng and k are very unstable in Sino-Tibetan and m and p, n and t, so I don't think that's a big problem. So these people have a shared vocabulary of agriculture, which you will not find with the Austroasiatics. Now that needs an explanation. Not only do they have the shared vocabulary, but they have the same kind of agriculture. They have foxtail millet and rice. The Austronesians, the Proto-Austronesians and the Formosans today do have foxtail millet and rice. Now if the Formosans came from South China, they wouldn't have foxtail millet. Where would they get it from? Foxtail millet is a northern Chinese thing. It was domesticated in North China, not in South China.
One thing that I realize we've not uh, told them, we haven't actually worked on much, but uh, I mentioned that uh, one of the things that uh, Starostin included in his reconstruction of Old Chinese uh, was uh, a, he wrote MH or something instead of M when you had an upper register nasal in, uh, or upper register M in the Min dialect. So you do have some words in the Min dialects well, it's not just in the Min dialect, but it's especially prominent there. <coughs> ordinarily, since uh, uh, you have these resonant initials, they're ordinarily in lower register tones because they're voiced. But we do find some that are in upper register tones, and there's some degree of agreement among dialects as to which those words are. And I think Mi is one of them, isn't that what you just said? Uh, so we, isn't this what we do? We assume that there was a voiceless pre uh, initial pre-syllable there, which dropped so that the, the voicelessness of the priest of the first uh, initial consonant is probably what's responsible for leaving this uh, uh, the uh, nasal in an upper register tone. Yeah, that's one of the evidences for reconstructing pre syllables that we haven't fully tapped yet. Uh, yes? Not also the case that in, in, um, in the change of the tones uh, for the shangsheng, um, if there is an M initial, that it doesn't change to Chu sheng. Well, that's it's true in, well. in all Chinese yeah, dialects. Yeah. Actually, is this connected to, or possibly connected to what you said, just, just said? Well, I don't, yeah, so I don't think so. I mean, one thing that happens in, uh, in Min dialects is that some of the things which yeah, it is a general fact about yeah, since all in, in Chinese Binchen, dialects. It, 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 it uh, infects the tone. So the tone hmm? in Pinchang, in Pinchang, the tone changes, doesn't it? So it goes to well, the lower register. The yeah. point is, yeah, in, in Mandarin, you have tone one and tone yeah. two. You do have some upper register uh, uh, resonance in tone one yeah. in, in Mandarin. But I, suspect, I don't know if they're connected or not. M many of them are verbs of uh, action, like rung, uh, mo, uh, I think of all the rest. But anyway, I, I don't know if that's connected or not, but, it, but it's quite possible that there was some kind of a prefix there that, that caused them, or maybe it was just a tone process. But generally speaking, it is not all voiced initials in Changsheng which go to Qusheng, it's mm -hmm. only the voiced obstruent initials. Um, and it, they don't, I mean, some dialects never undergo this change. Uh, but um, among Min dialects, which do, uh, there are some words which do change to Chusheng, even though they appear to have resonant initials. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing to explain. As some of them are just because, it's because they're still fricatives, like uh, I, I suspect. Uh, what? What's, who speaks uh, Taiwanese? Anybody know? It's, anyway, it's a, uh, what is yo in Taiwanese? What tone is it? It's a wu, right? Well, it may be tone six, I don't know. Or rain? Okay, well, I probably uh, uh, shouldn't talk more about things I don't know anything about, but, uh, but uh, anyway, this, it's nothing exceptional for M's not to go to, to Chushan. If they're Shangshan M's not to go to Chushan, it would be exceptional if they did. Yeah. And there may be some cases like that, I just don't remember. But there are a number of cases. Where there are a lot of little funny things about the Min dialects that we haven't mentioned and haven't also haven't fully accounted for. Uh, sometimes you have uh, S instead of L in the initial position, like uh, Li Liang the Li has got an initial S at least in some new dialects. So. In the column of storage attic, who reconstruct the word for Setaria or Kri or Kri or the Zaid. Zaid. Oh. Oh, uh, no, that's maybe in Munda. This is this is just X. That means X, that means it's some kind of it's it's not a uh, a phonetic symbol. Oh, okay, okay. It means uh, some, there's something here, he doesn't know what it is. Mm. Maybe a vowel. Something like oi or.
finished. Okay, well, it's time to... What time is it? Quarter to four. Take a break. Take a break and think of what you want to talk about in the last hour. I, s I think we can, we can make it a, a general session uh, to review any, any of the questions that we've discussed in this, uh, in this summer course. Are there any things that you would like to discuss or go over? Things to do with uh, general overview on Monday morning by Bill, or the uh, word structure Monday afternoon, uh, affixation. Uh, Tuesday morning was uh, onsets. Evolution of onsets into Middle Chinese. Tuesday afternoon, evolution of rhymes. This morning, while why we think we're on the right track, and that was mostly, mostly paleography. And this afternoon, Sino-Tibetan and beyond. Any? Maybe they just want to go home. You want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Where's a, where, where is our ancestral home? We should know that first. We? What, our own? You mean Indo-European? In Scotland. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. It's a bit off, uh, out of our line, but... Uh, um, yeah, there is just a joke. He said we want to go home, but... Oh, we, I see. We where is our home? Our do we head to? Yeah, do we head to? Uh, we don't know. The Ukraine or Anatolia or what? Yeah. So either way to go home. Well, if I can just general wondering how much does the knowledge of Proto-Austronesian help you with going to Chinese? Is it uh, do you get? I can safely say that it's no help at all. No help at all. Because I don't know anything about us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But does it give you any pathways? Uh, would would you imagine coming where you have a certain structure is not knowing what you know from Proto-Austronesian and possible relationship? For instance, structure minus syllable, all those things, uh, iambic uh, structure. And uh, something about the morphology. Well, it's similar to what you know, I, I talked about when uh, talking about evidence for Old Chinese. I was talking about uh, the way we think you should use uh, evidence from Tibeto Burman. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, uh, yeah, when somebody once asked us, you know, when would you reconstruct uh, something in Chinese based on Tibeto Burman mm -hmm. or a dis distinction in Old Chinese based on the distinction in Tibetan Burman in law, and I said, in unison, never. Right? No, 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 it's not, it's not what that you reconstruct on the basis. Yeah, but. but it's a general yeah, awareness yeah, of right. what is going on. So, well, I think the more languages you're aware of, the better you, yeah. you are, but what, what, these, what a knowledge like this is useful for, I think, is it is a source of hypotheses. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, you still have to test the hypotheses on Chinese evidence. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, they may they could conceivably lead you astray, but you've got to get your hypotheses from somewhere. And uh, so that's basically. Well, that's it. what I know, yes. but it yeah. seems like. And I, I then I guess yeah. Laurent had to answer that part because. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I think the first thing that when I. F y the first uh, idea that I got from uh, from Austronesian, I think, was uh, had something to do with. Uh, I don't know how much you talked about it. I didn't talk about it. It's the, the our um, our idea that the old Chinese script is uh, something like a syllabary. Uh, we talked about that. We talked mm -hmm. about that. Yes, I think I first it first struck me 
when I was trying to relate Austronesian disyllables with uh, Chinese monosyllables. And the way I did, it, I did that was to... The first thing that I saw was that the second syllable of Austronesian words was not too difficult to relate phonologically with simple conversion rules to to one of the monosyllables that we see in in, uh, in Sino Tibetan. So the way I did that was to uh, was to take Austronesian words, keep the last syllable, and on the basic of that last syllable, sort of think how would that be written if it was written in Chinese. And the first thing would be what phonetic would work for it. Mm -hmm. And and then I looked for the character and mm -hmm. when I was lucky I found something. So that's that's one uh, mm -hmm. I think that's one insight I got from Austronesian. But we're well, coming back to the questions of people posing uh, from all Chinese um, about sign of the deaf languages. Do you mean a slightly slightly distinction in for Austronesian, something which would point out in this direction? Well, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, had, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've had several ideas, <laughs> too many actually. Uh, my first idea was that uh, the, the, the Calgren's yod was an infix, and I tried to relate that to the in infix of Austronesian, and that was a very bad idea. Mm. But so, because obviously, because uh, well, the functions do not match. There are basically there are no functions of. of uh, no identifiable morphological functions of type B in Chinese and uh, it corresponds to length in Lu Shai, uh, to, to short, short vowels in Lu Shai, all sorts of reasons it's, it's a bad idea. And the next idea that I had was that it's uh, it has to do with the material that is lost mm -hmm. in the evolution to, to Sino Tibetan, the first, the first vowel that is lost. And I found a correlation, again not a 100% correlation, but a kind of statistical correlation between voicing, between voiced initial in Austronesian, voiced initials in Austronesian, and type B, and voiceless initials in type A. I think this, co this correlation exists, but I really don't know how to, how to relate it. To. Well, the R infix exists in Austronesian, and that's uh, it's true that I got the idea of the R infix mm -hmm. in Chinese from from Austronesian. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that there were it could explain mm -hmm. things, and that that has, I think, stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. I should I should say at the beginning I was very skeptical about that. Uh, I wasn't. Uh, very familiar with infixes in the first place, and uh, uh, the idea that this would be an infix uh, didn't uh, didn't strike me as very plausible. Uh, but it uh, I, I became persuaded because, uh, well, first of all, you do have these pairs, one with an R and one without the R. Now, sometimes there's no detectable semantic uh, distinction in our glosses and so forth with them; you can't tell. But especially the thing about the about uh, eyes, for example, uh, that's a nice one because there's a, a kind of a nun or I don't know which it is uh, that means what is it a lump or something? No, a, a bulge. A bulge, yes. Yeah. A bulge. And then if you put an R in it, then you get eyes, and it's it's almost like a dual. Thing. Um, and another thing is, I guess um, I mentioned this before, but I think I'd like to come back to it. The, the importance of the little uh, details as well as the big picture, because uh, I think uh, as linguists, as historical linguists, we like it best when we can uh, make a rule that accounts for, you know, half the lexicon of the language or something like that that you can find over and over again. But in fact, I think the changes that take place in a language are 
Some of them are big and some of them are small. Um, and uh, so, for example, well, uh, in uh, Michigan, everybody seems to say roof instead of roof and uh, pool instead of pool and things like that. It's just this one vowel that's different. So there are a number of cases, uh, well, realizing that there could be an R where, even when there was no evidence for it, made it uh, look as if it, it would be easier, to, of course, it would be easier to maintain this, uh, this uh, generalization about the R infix. Now, of course, you can say, well, you don't know any, if there's an R or not, but the recognition that there are some forms that systematically, mm -hmm. where the, the R is systematically undetectable, mm -hmm. uh, sort of helps you explain why you might find some, uh, some exceptions. Uh, but there are a lot of little things. For example, I didn't uh, mention this, I, I didn't have time to, but um, the TSR initials in uh, Middle Chinese, the ones that come from an R and so forth, uh, if you look in the rhyme tables, which is late Middle Chinese, they're all in division two. That's mm -hmm. what that's where they put them. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and in, but some of them, according to, I mean, they, some of them should be in division three, mm -hmm. if they developed like anything else. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, you often have the situation where you have, what well, basically, what happened here is I think that there are some that. Uh, when you had a TSR initial, there was a very strong tendency for, in, in traditional terms, for it to move from division three to division two, which in terms of our notation means to lose the J. Um, and it's, uh, if the J was really some kind of a glide, and the, the, the R, you know, might easily eat it up, as it has, I mean, a similar thing happened in uh, modern Mandarin, uh, where you had, you used to have syllables like GM and so forth, but they, and some dialects still do, but they have been <coughs> reduced. But that one discovery that just in that particular context, um, uh, there was this minor sound change going on, just the loss of J after, after R, basically, in the middle Chinese, uh, explained a bunch of annoying, what had been annoying exceptions. And one of them is the word sheng, to, to be born or to live. Uh, and if you look it up, you know, in the in the Guangyun, you you will come up with the spelling S R A E N G. Okay, so it's division two with an A E vowel. Uh, however, the Old Chinese rhyme group is is the E N, that is the Gang Bu. Uh, there is no standard way to get from Gang Bu to A E N G. So Carlgren says the word is irregular, uh, don't, has no explanation. Uh, Li Fang Gui also says it's irregular, no explanation. But if you look it up in the Qiyun manuscript instead of the Guangyun, and I think it also appears this way in the Jingyun Shu one, you also get S-R-J-A-E-N-G. Uh, in fact, it's Suo uh, Jing, Beijing de Jing, Qie, or Fa. And uh, then the Guangyun has Suo Gung. So we seem to have Fanche spellings from both before and after this uh, change where the, uh, S, the Y was dropped, the J was dropped. Well, that explains it because J A E N G is a regular reflex of R E nasal. Okay. Uh, this also explains the word for kill, right? Mm -hmm. Sha is S R E A T. And uh, so, ordinarily, E-A-T would indicate that you have a front vowel there, E-T instead of A-T. And uh, well, I mean, of course, it shouldn't bother us, but uh, we do know, you know, uh, in the back of our minds, we do know that there's this uh, uh, Sino-Tibetan root, uh, which is something like Sat for kill. And in uh, uh, Sha, I think it rhymes in the Shijing, and it rhymes as as uh, as if it were ot, mm -hmm. but I think that's a case where you had s something like s r j e t, drop the j. Well, it turns out in e a t, but it's basically the same process. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no problem to to 
to reconstruct this word with ot, which explains the rhymes and which happens to fit the, the comparative elements better too. Although, I, you know, as I say, we don't we don't uh, use that uh, to test our hypotheses, but to produce help produce the hypotheses. So a lot of I mean I think uh, a lot of times there people want to paint with a very large brush and they want to establish very general rules and there certainly are very general rules but there are also little details about what happened if you really want to understand this, uh, the history of a language you have to worry about the little stuff as well as the big stuff and uh, often if you pay attention to it that will uh, that will considerably clarify the picture so that one move uh, sort of solved several puzzles at once. Mm -hmm. Also, for example, uh, you know the chabia, the cha, to, mm -hmm. okay, or chabador de cha. Uh, if you know uh, the first poem in the Shi Jing, it's a chen zi xing cai zuo yo cai zhi, and so forth. That chen zi, that zi is, uh, is written as cha. Well, there it is written as if it were division three. It's T S R H J E, uh, and that's why people read it as tz nowadays. Uh, but that's an old spelling that got passed down through the reading tradition or something, and the and cha is a perfectly regular development from that by the loss of the J in the same way that these other things happen. Mm -hmm. So it just it, it pays to pay attention to the details as well as the big picture. I don't know what started me on that. But. I'd like to know what are the main differences between your reconstruction and the reconstruction by other scholars like uh, Pan Wien or Chaucer. What's the main difference between our reconstruction and Pan's, for instance? Well, there are a few things. Um, um, I would check anything about this answer. I mean, I'm not certain of it, but. Um, on what do you disagree? Yeah, I, I'm getting there. Um, uh, Pan and uh, Zheng Zhang uh, have, after having got rid of the first J by calling it vowel, a short vowel, they have a new J which is responsible for palatalization. So uh, for us, the T in type B, T initial in type B always goes to TSY unless there's an R after it. But they account for that palatalization by putting in a J after the T. Now, I think, I don't really understand why that's necessary, and it seems to me it's, it's a, a, you don't want to, I mean, you don't want to have too many possible solutions. You don't want to have, you want to constrain the system as much as you can, and you don't want to have a lot of wild cards that make it easy to solve problems. You want to solve problems sort of, when the rules are hard, not when the rules are easy. Um, so I haven't fully figured out what the advantages of, they think the advantages of doing that are, but, but uh, that's one thing. I think too, now this is a case of sort of uh, not looking at the small, at the little things. I think that they were saying that uh, Chungyo Sandan, the third division Chungyo doublets, all, came from an R. All of them. Okay. Well, most of them do come from an R, but there are certain environments where you can't detect the R, then you would get the same result even if there were no R. So I think, for example, in words like P to the P, right? remember in P bear, I, I think we think there's an R because that we think that that the net on top is phonetic. But P for the P is exactly a homonym of that, and we put the R in parentheses. It could have been by, it could have uh, by, it could have been bry. Okay, we don't know. But I think that uh, Zheng Zhang and uh, and Pan put an R there because it's third division Chunyo, so they've got a gap that we don't uh, we don't have. And then what else have they? They've added some other things, right? So they, they do they do this. Yeah. So what does that uh, what do they do with what uh, without a TR? I think some of the, that allows them to say some of those are T's. 
think if it's just a T, the I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, the fact is that uh, I don't know their uh, systems as well as I should. I mean, we've been working on our own stuff more than we've been checking with theirs. Because their T T short vowel go to? I think T short vowel goes to T R J. What oh, we would call T R J. Yeah. yeah. TR goes to TRJ and T goes to TRJ, right? Yeah, except, I mean, I, I mentioned this in conversation with a few people, but, but uh, actually, if, if you look at it, you'll see that the TR, TR and T in Middle Chinese are in complementary distribution with like one exception. Uh, so it is quite possible that what we write as TR was actually in, in some dialect uh, uh, a T. It's these, this TR is used to transcribe Sanskrit retroflex uh, stops. That's one of the reasons for believing that it, w that it was retroflex. But once you've taken the, the regular T's to TSY, you don't need the R anymore. You can drop the R and you'll still have all the contrast. The only only exception is the word D fang D, which is irregular anyway. It's D I J capital H and there's no there's no nobody knows how to account for that. Uh, so it is possible that and in fact we find Fanche spellings, especially in the south, I think in the Jing Dian Shu one, where uh, where you would where you're spelling a T R something word, the initial speller will just have a T, and there are few, uh, instead of T R, and there are a few cases like that in the Guan Yun also. So, uh, so it's not quite as bizarre as it might seem to say that a regular T just goes to T R J because that T R J could be a T, could be a T J. Right? I mean, we don't, uh, we still don't uh, agree with it because, uh, as I say, we. Once you add a J, you double the number of possible syllables, right? You can either have a J or not. So uh, the more syllables you've got, the, mo the easier it is to solve any problem. You can relate it to, you know, cling on, whatever you want. So the way that you avoid, uh, I mean, the way that you keep yourself on the right track is keeping the system tight enough so that your choices in any given situation are, are few in number. I think they use J also to get them palatalization out of anything, out of velar. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is another they thing, velar palatalization. They have KJ. Yeah. Sorry, uh, KJ going to TSY, and I think they even have PJ going to TSY, don't they? Probably, yeah. yeah. yeah I think so. Um, so, velar palatalization is a case where uh, there is a theory which works pretty well, which is that dealers palatalize before front vowels. I think that was Pulley Blank that first came up with that. But there are cases which clearly have dealer connections, which uh, don't seem to have a front vowel after them, but you've got a palatalization anyway. Uh, one is the word for uh, red, for example. Yeah, or, or some of these. And uh, so, uh, well, in my book, I just uh, what did I do? I wrote it. I wrote it in capital letters. If it was uh, if it palatalized irregularly, just so. Uh, I mean, if you see a capital letter in my book, it means it's an unsolved problem. So, um, and uh, now, well, we we now think that some of these things had a T on the beginning, so it's not. I mean, you can that also doubles the number of possibilities, I suppose. But we're looking for things to correlate to that T, not just, you know, out of the blue. We wouldn't really want to keep the T unless we can, if the only evidence for it is palatalization. It, we'd have to fit better into the picture somewhere else. So I think we, yeah. Yeah, this is... For instance, that's what we have in... in uh, needle, for example. In, that's, that's a Q in needle. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but in Joe, elbow. Right. Yeah, just uh, nine. Okay. No, it's not nine. Uh, it's, uh, oh, well, I forget. Uh, oh, it's a swim. Oh, yes. Joe. That's uh, uh, T R J U W X. 
Yeah, so that's... That's not palatalization. We reconstruct... The crew. The crew global stock going to TR J U W U X. And we have reasons to think that the T was first because uh, in the same series you get uh, which in fact goes to the to the Chio and elbow, you know, Chio now is the picture of an elbow. You also get uh, Oh, cho, the cho. Oh, cho, the cho, which is uh, a palatal. another palatal thing. So you have. So this is not a palatal. Yeah. Yeah, palatalizations clustered in this phonetic series. You get one gets palatalization, the other gets gets a retroflex T, but that has to be. You cannot get both without a T. Okay, so there has to be a T there, and it has to be it has to be first, and that fits well with the Tibetan Burman evidence. And notice that there are two of them, right? Mm. Uh, however, in uh, in the case of Chu, things are different. We seem to have a the order seems to be reversed. Seems to be tut, at least in this one, Chu seems to be just tut, and this one seems to be from tut. So it's not always the case that it's from TK. Sometimes it's from KT. Uh, but KT will give you the velar, right? It's not going to give you a palatal. Right, KT will give you the velar, but the single, the single, the, the K with the T the, without the, the, the K, the T without the, the K will give you the palatal. Uh, an example we have is the word for uh, uh, the word for paper, which is J. And here the evidence provided by Rook. Uh, the word is Kachai, Kachai in in Rook. So on the surface, J seems to be a perfectly normal T phonetic, but the, um, there are velars in it, and Rook explains why, because it was k k j or k t. So it's not, not always t k, sometimes it's k t. Um, in, in terms of star students' reconstruction, also very similar, but uh, there are a few differences. One is Starston actually has an additional set of, uh, of uh, African initials. He writes both TS and then he writes a C with a, an accent over it. And I've never, uh, maybe if I go back and read it carefully, I would be understand better what the justification for that is. But so far we've not adopted that idea. He thought they were kept separate in phonetic series and so forth. Um, and uh, another difference is that, uh, well, although he had a six vowel system and mostly has rounded vowels where we have rounded vowels and unrounded vowels where we have unrounded vowels, um, he believed that this distinction was neutralized after labial initials. So he didn't think there would be a contrast between uh, mun, for instance, and one. Right, remember we had M schwa, M -M schwa M or maybe N or maybe it's M M schwa R, I'm not sure, for gate, and then M U N for to uh, uh, here and uh, and one 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 to one. Uh, and actually on that, uh, while Starston was still alive, uh, it, it was here in Paris. Actually, I gave a a talk at the Sino-Tibetan conference, I, I figured out a way probabilistically to see how uh, how hard it would be. I mean, I thought I had separated these labial initial syllables into rounded and unrounded on the basis of the rhymes, okay? And so I tried to figure out uh, how hard would it be to get that amount of separation uh, if there were really no difference. That is, how frequently would this degree of separation arise? So it's a kind of a, a simulation uh, or Monte Carlo method of trying to do that. And I came out that it was very, uh, a very low probability that that separation would happen by chance. And uh, Sergei was uh, gracious enough to say that he felt that I was right about that. Um, but we, actually there, there are not that many differences. 
I think uh, Sergey also had a, a where I, we have a capital A, and there's a sort of unsolved, there's an A that fronts for un, un, unexplained reasons. Uh, uh, he just wrote an IA there, and that's, uh, and assumed that such a thing existed, and it didn't seem to me to, to fit into the system very well, so we haven't done that. But it's, it's mostly in details like that. The, uh, um, I, I was just telling you about Kill. I, I think that if you look up Kill in uh, Chung Chung's book or in uh, Pan's book, it'll be S-R-E-T on the basis of the E-A-T final, which usually reflects R-E-T. So they don't have this little uh, uh, minor clause that says that except if it's a T-S-R initial, you may get division two from earlier division three. So it's little details like that. Well, I mean, that's um, among the six vowelers, right? I mean, if you talk about Li and, well, it's interesting actually to, to com uh, compare with uh, Gung Huang Chung, who started with uh, uh, Li's system and defended it vigorously, but uh, over the last 20 years or so, has gradually adopted more and more of the same hypotheses that we uh, believe, uh, such as the the uh, uh, the uh, role of R in third division as well as second division. What else? Uh, can't remember. Oh, R instead of L is the source of, of Middle Chinese L. Uh, several things like that. Yeah, and, and actually he added laterals to the system because we did not have laterals, didn't have L and HL like we had. Uh, so, I mean, people sometimes complain that the old Chinese, old Chinese reconstruction is so all over the map and everybody looks, you know, uh, who can you believe and it's, uh, you know, uh, might as well just stick with good old Carlgren. I, I guess I'm paraphrasing uh, Matisoff here. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it, it, it may look that way at first glance, but there are these researchers, uh, us, I mean, we didn't start out the same either, right? Us and Pan and, uh, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. Cheng Zhang and uh, Gung Huang Cheng. Uh, well, Gung Huang Cheng do still doesn't accept six vowels, but uh, so, so they're, they're really a great deal in common. And Pulley Blank uh, didn't, hasn't really worked out his old Chinese system completely, so it's hard to say. He is very attached to the idea that there were only two vowels in uh, old Chinese. Uh, well, you could rewrite our system so that it had only two vowels if you do this I schwa and I A and U schwa and U A. That's all you'd have to do, right? Uh, and, other, and in other respects, uh, meant much of his uh, uh, system is... Oh, I know another one is where we have a, a coda J, Han and, uh, and Zheng Zhang have L, and so does uh, Pulley Blank. And there again, I, it, I don't see why you would pick an L when you still didn't have a J, and the Chinese reflexes all seem to show a J, so... so uh, and Pan and uh, Zheng Zhang both speak dialect, a dialect, Wen Zhou Hua, where the, the J is still there, but they seem to think it comes from an L, and, uh, uh, well, it could be right, of course, but uh, I just don't, we just don't see a reason to do it that way. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we have, uh, well, the main thing is that database that we 
that we can access each when we want. Um, even when we can access it together, we can work on it at the same time. Uh, so we can work on that at our rhythm and we can decide. What we do is that we have almost weekly um, video conferences uh, using Skype or AIM and during these video conferences we decide what we... we discuss the issues we, we want to discuss and also we decide what we need to do on that database. Uh, we also see each other on a, um, not on a regular basis, but uh, Usually, a few, few times a year. At least once or twice a year, yeah. yeah. Such as now. And uh, that's, the way, that's the way we do it. I think there's a, uh, there's a kind of a division of labor in that uh, I know very little about the Proto-Austronesian, or for that matter, Tibeto-Burman and uh, Laurent has most of that, and uh, I spend more time on the Chinese sources, and of course, I mean, our, if, we, if our points of view were always identical, there would hardly be any reason to collaborate. The whole benefit of collaboration is to sort of uh, have to justify what you say to somebody else, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, well, we know each other well enough. I think if we didn't know each other well, it would be much uh, harder to do because uh, uh, one of us would get the impression that the other was mad at us if we were at the, at the you know we were arguing or something like this. Um, and uh, I I can say we uh, have great respect for each other's uh, abilities and and uh, knowledge and things like that. So. Uh, we're not likely to be dis dismissive of what the other person says. So if you can find somebody like that, I mean, if, you, if it's something, somebody you just met last year, I doubt if you're going to be able to work uh, and do serious collaboration with the person. I think you really have to know somebody uh, pretty well for it to work uh, well. And as I say, I think you have to learn a little bit about the other person's specialization. We're, I mean, we're, we certainly worked on a lot of the same things before we started. Uh, and as I say, uh, well, it sort of started when uh, Laurent invited me uh, to visit here. Uh, at, it, this was after my book was out and before his book came out, and we started uh, talking about things then. And then, uh, and the video business really makes a difference uh, yep. because uh, you know if I start saying something and I saw see uh, <laughs> Laurent going. You know, uh, making some kind of French uh, facial gesture, uh, then I know that I've sort of got to slow down and explain, you know, I, I can see how he's reacting. And uh, if we were just on the phone, we wouldn't be able to do that, or, or certainly not in email. It's, it, it, so there's a lot more information being exchanged on video. Uh, so that's another, uh, so we recommend that as well. The database is really great. The database. That's right. That's, that's right. That's uh, right. I, I have to say I don't usually. I'm not usually a booster like a Midwestern American, uh, but I have to say that I'm really. Uh, I really appreciate the the expertise in computer matters at the University of Michigan because, uh, I mean, we yeah. had this. We f I found this guy. I mean, I, I came here. It was two years ago, I guess. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that when it started? And uh, this guy at the University of Michigan, uh, we told him what we wanted, and by the end of the month, we had it going. It was just it's really remarkable. But uh, the the software is also excellent. Because I work for the International Dumpang Project, so yes. I'm, a, I'm a dependency in, in Berlin, and they oh. had so much trouble with their working together with one database, and this was always a problem with synchronization, so yeah. things never appeared when they were supposed to appear, yeah. and so I it's really, I can really appreciate that, that's fantastic. Yes, Alex? Yeah. Um, I have a question. At the beginning of the talk, well, that was probably not the right time to ask, and time went by very quickly. So we had to stop, but perhaps as there's some extra time, we could return to the question of uh, the hypothesis of monosyllabization and the link between the change from uh, cisquisyllables to monosyllables 
and the appearance of uh, type A, type B. And um, so you pointed out a counterexample, uh, which is the word for elbow. Um, and the question of methodology is um, basically how many examples could make the theory look serious and worth checking in detail, and how many counterexamples like like this one would make you, you know, make that kind of French face saying, well, that's perhaps not worth examining. Oh. <laughs> so, so that's a question of methodology. Perhaps it's not testable um, statistically, but if it's not um, statistically significant, does it show well, that it's not worth pursuing and looking at okay. individual cases? And well, I remember when I asked this question, Michel Servius this question, he said, I gave him a number of uh, examples of type B words that had clusters that you had to reconstruct with clusters in, 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 all, in all Chinese. And he said, yes, but the point is, at the time when type A, type B appear, the, these words have clusters. OK? Right. So uh, the example of elbow that I gave you a moment ago was an example of a word that we can be sure had a cluster at the moment that type A, type B, I mean, probably. I mean, uh, well, they chose to write it with the same phonetic. Uh, I mean, the phonetic that it uh, Now, I've given one counterexample. Let Michel give me an example of a word that he was sure did not have a cluster. I mean, I don't, I don't know uh, how to put it. Uh, it seems to... I, in theory, it's a, possible, it's a possible explanation, but I haven't seen any kind of correlation with the facts that I see every day. Uh, you asked me oh, what I think, what I thought of that. I've given you that counterexample. I'm sure I could find more. Well, uh, they're, they're just a lot. Uh, for instance... Uh, how about gen? Uh, yeah, needle. Needle. Uh, paper. No, paper Paper is a little bit. Okay, we don't care but about gen, that. Gen, uh, you have to reconstruct with a, with a uh, TQ. You reconstruct with TQ in Chinese. The word had a also had a prefix T, uh, dental prefix in particular German. In Mar Martin's uh, Tamang, it was it has it has a D initial. So the D initial has replaced the the the, the, video, the U video. So this one is type B, and it had a cluster. Uh, what else? Well, well, let me say this. I mean, gentle pillow. Yeah. Um, in fact, I don't know of any cases. Where there are type A clusters. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, if you could give me maybe one example that fit this uh, theory, that would help. But I mean, look, you know, this is what we tell you today. I mean, it, it is a fact that uh, when you look at the data, uh, you never, it's never just going this way. You're also, you know, you also have thoughts about it. So it may be somehow that if we look at things a little differently, we would see a pattern such as you suggest. I mean, that would be one way to explain why the initial would be somehow stronger or heavier or more resistant to change. But uh, I have so other, apart from the fact that uh, that it is plausible. In it, I mean, it's not implausible. On, on the, it seems like it would be a fairly natural explanation. Apart from that, as far as I know, we have no reason to think that that's the case. We simply have no e even examples that would suggest that. Another, well, no, I'm, that's not the same. By the way, a nine in Tibetan is dipu, right? Yeah. yeah. Nine, dipu, yeah. That's another one. Thank you. Uh, Although it, the, the chi is. Chi, chi, uh, chi is type B, right? Which chi? Seven. Chi is type B, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Snit, snit. And three in Tibetan. Right. The sum three. Well, that's type A, but uh, we don't have any. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's type A. We're not sure. It's. Uh, it could be a case. There are type B forms of that word too, so we don't know. There's. Uh, the the yeah, yeah. Yeah. inside the tsun, That's uh, the same. That's type B. Yeah. Thanks very much. Well, we have lost 10 minutes, so nobody, uh, yeah.
has questions. I have a question for everybody. Do we want a similar kind of seminar next year? Would you be ready to participate in, uh, in a similar sound school next year? Is it something that you would recommend to your colleagues, students? Yeah. Well, it looks awkward with us here. I mean, how are they going to say, no, I don't ever want to see these people again. <laughs> some sort of a good basic knowledge. Yeah. If I think, for example, about my students in Ghent, for them to participate in a workshop like this would be very, very hard, even after the linguistic seminary. It would be a, a good, yeah, maybe would be a good, but I think it would be too much and too mm -hmm. difficult. And, uh, so it depends on, on who's going to participate. I had the chance uh, to participate uh, last year in Leiden and uh, compared with uh, this seminar, uh, I think uh, that this seminar was uh, much more better uh, than in Leiden because uh, you had uh, much more information and uh, it was a uh, very uh, clear structure and uh, in very short time it's very good. Your question, Katja, was it whether uh, we would like to have a kind of follow-up for the same group of people or a repetition well, for a different I think we need group to keep of people? people or or to ask no. people to join us, yeah. but that we can, for instance, say that we want only advanced people who would be able to demonstrate that they already know some of the system, so that they read the books and that they're working in the same direction and they would be able to readily join us at some more advanced stage. Or what we can do, we can make it for everybody open and say that we start from the beginning and then there would be all kinds of students, different people at different levels joining. So it's, it's also up to you. So we can either go up and make something, some kind of discussion workshop when different people also present things. Not only Bill and Laurent, but also somebody else. We can choose topics ahead of time, or we can keep it just to, to kind of summer school types that we're learning from Laurent more passively on our side. So. Yeah. But I don't find, without wanting to speak to anybody, I can myself, but I, with this kind of very complex things, what usually does it take for me to, to really understand it and not only superficially is to have to do it myself. Mm. To choose one thing at least and you know to say, now given the things that we taught you, mm. um, how would you reconstruct this? Mm. And uh, so because it is only then when you see what kind mm -hmm. of alternatives and things you really have to take into account. Mm. Uh, if you only hear it, you, you believe that you understand it in the moment, and one hour later you are no longer so sure. Mm. That mm. Mm. The we, I think it would be, it's a very good idea to, for us to try to assemble some a set of exercises, even if they're just on the web or something, so people can get work through them and try to do that. I, I made up a few for Leiden, but it's mm. really a... a, a I hadn't done it in any kind of comprehensive way. Um, 
I mean, if you're interested in what I would recommend as a, as a step to, to sort of get farther, uh, just take a poem in the Shi Jing and uh, uh, first step is to transcribe it in Middle Chinese in this notation and then uh, try to figure out and then look at the rhymes. Uh, you can look up in any reference book what the rhymes are supposed to be according to that reference. I mean, there, there's it's disagreements, but most of them are, most of them are no problem. Uh, another thing that I think people generally are not uh, able to do, but which is, would be useful to do, is to simply be able to recognize when you're coming across a rhymed passage. So there are many texts like Zhuangzi, Laozi, even or Zhuang, things like that, which have rhymed passages in them, but uh, I don't think uh, there are plenty of times when people don't recognize that they're rhymes. I mean, rhyming is a basic structural element in uh, large parts of the Lao Tzu, for, for sure. Uh, and when you come across a rhyme passage in anything, Shunzi, anything, it, it, it is meaningful that that part is rhymed and the rest of it's not rhymed. I, mean, it, 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 uh, I don't think you can fully understand the text unless you can do that. So another kind of exercise is to take a text like that, go through it in Middle Chinese, uh, actually just becoming familiar with the Middle Chinese for a fair number of words. Just that kind of transcription alone, I think, would be very, very useful. You would find it very useful. For example, it would become clearer to you why things sound the way they do in uh, in Sino-Japanese or Sino-Vietnamese or Sino-Korean, uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's almost impossible to to make sense of it from the Mandarin point of view. So I mean, I I, I think you're right that that uh, a systematic set of exercises would be a good idea, and we need to do that. But in the absence of that, I'm suggesting some things if you want to follow up. Uh, those are things that I would, I would suggest, mm -hmm. especially with the Shi Jing, which is a basic thing everybody, well, not everybody needs to know, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask a, a question about a, a, a reconstruction kit by Laurent Segard that you oh. handed out to us in Leiden two years ago, which was in 2005, based on lectures given in in Chicago, I want to know if it's still actual. We've got a table which uh, allows you to reconstruct the old Chinese on the basis of uh, Professor Baxter's Middle Chinese notation. So. Oh, is it still? There's probably some I, some changes, some new things. Mm -hmm. the, I uh, think the the finals are more stable than the initials. Mm -hmm. So, as far as the finals are concerned, it's unless there's just errors in it, which. I think uh, actually uh, Dirk pointed out some errors, but I will show it to you, and I wanted it's to know. Probably, it's probably, it's probably, it's yeah. There's not all the clusters in them, so it's it's probably, uh, yeah, it's probably still valid by and large. But I, I have to, I have to look at it. But you know, we, we uploaded a document on on the website that gives you the evolution of uh, onsets. So any difference that you find between this new document and that one, the new document would represent mm -hmm. the later version of our thinking. And I also wanted to add that maybe if we um, have a follow-up or another summer school of this kind, it would be nice to also do what apparently I have done last year in Leiden and we're doing this year to, to show us this team work uh, together with paleographers that you're talking mm -hmm. about to have some uh, maybe presentations done by people who work on this graphic side of things uh, that mm. would be a nice add-up. And now thanks to Bill and Bob. <laughs> <laughs>